Well, beloved in Christ, grace to you in peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And also with you. Our text this morning is found in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians was written by the great apostle Paul to the churches around Ephesus to describe the mystery and scope of God's generous and far-reaching gift of salvation for everyone who trusts in Christ, Jews and Gentiles alike. The apostle Paul wrote these words while he was in prison, probably around AD 60. Why was Paul in jail? He was in jail for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, we can say that Paul was in prison nearly four years at this time because of his preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. Why was Paul preaching to them? Because God's divine purpose regarding them had been revealed to Paul, and through him, God's salvation plan would be revealed to the entire world. And because of this, the Jews who hated Paul for his Christianity and his spreading of it to the entire world pursued after him and eventually got him thrown into captivity. Our text this morning begins with Paul in prison comforting the Ephesian Christians in their faith even when it was he sitting alone in jail that should have been the one being comforted. So how could he do that? How could someone sitting in prison be so concerned with comforting and building up others in their faith? Well, it's because Paul had an inner strength. And this strength that Paul possessed is the same strength that you and I as Christians should possess. You see, loved ones, the Christian's strength comes from the inside. It comes from our soul, our spirit, our love, our very life. And while this strength is oftentimes buried deep within, it can be found by looking for the real me. Today's reading is from the book of Ephesians, our epistle lesson for this morning, I would ask again if you're able to rise out of respect for the glorious truth of God. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. These are your holy words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in its truth. Your word is the only truth. Thank you. Please be seated. There's probably real validity to the idea that man oftentimes is not what he seems to be. In other words, what is seen on the outside of a person might show very little of what goes on on the inside. True, our outer acts might reveal our inner nature, but not necessarily. You see, there is a certain amount of human camouflage in every one of us. We cover up much of what we really are so that our real self is never known. And quite frankly, too much of the time, we are more concerned with the outer appearance than our inner life. As example, I suppose, look at what most of us do on a daily basis as we stand in front of a mirror in order to present ourselves in a fashionable appearance. Both women and men will groom and admire themselves sometimes for hours in front of a mirror. 
but neither seldom looks within themselves to see whether there are flaws and blemishes there. God's word for today is a text for looking inside of us. It's a text for looking at the real me. And it's an important text to pay attention to because too often we fail to recognize that there is a real me that is shoved into the background. Shoved so far back that even our consciousness doesn't pick it up. Seemingly our outside appearance holds the spotlight. Now I think I know most of you pretty well. And you all look friendly to me today. But I don't know whether you have grudges or hates or bitternesses within your soul. You don't seem worried, I'm, but I'm not sure you're not. You don't seem to be afraid because you are sitting quietly listening and everything seems fine. But maybe there's something inside of you that's rebelling. Rebelling over what has been said or rebelling over the fact of life or something. Perhaps something inside is gnawing at your soul and you don't know what it is because you have never taken time out to look at it. You know, people today seem so afraid to sit back and think about what life is really all about. Most are uneasy to do even a little introspection and meditating about their own life. They are too busy running here and there. They are too involved with this or that new thing. They are engulfed in the social media firestorm every hour of every single day. They never stop and say, I need to take a good look at myself. And we're not talking about looking in the mirror. Because the mirror doesn't show what's within. But the x-ray eyes of God certainly do. Therefore, it's important for us to take a good look on the inside to see what's going on in there and to take an honest look at the real me. And the real me is not just my will, my feelings, my emotions, my desires. The real me is that which centers in the will of God. Because the real me was created by God. For most people, the real me is starving. It is being forgotten amidst the range of worldly pursuits that the outside of a person seeks after. But the real me is that which was originally created in the image of God and we should never take that fact lightly. And you can camouflage the real me all you want. You can run here and there and do this or that with all kinds of busy things. You can chase after that next emotional high. You can fill your life with every single secular pursuit there is. You can run to escape. But you can't ever really get rid of that me that's inside. Because that me wants to be heard. Loved ones, it's the real me, the one inside, that needs to be dealt with. Because the inner self is the center of our being, the seat of intellect, emotion, and will. And it is these attributes that Christ will take completely over, take complete possession of, if the real me is heard. But unfortunately, we don't listen. We don't hear. So for many, the inner being becomes the seed of frail, spiritual anemia. So then what are the things that belong to the inside? What is this gnawing thing within me? Well, as I mentioned, it's the image of our Creator. When you look at Pastor John, you see my hands, my body, but you don't see my inside. But I am not two hands, I'm not a body, not a face, but something inside. 
That's why beauty is only skin deep. You know, many people will fall for someone who is really good looking on the outside, but who has nothing on the inside. And they pass right over someone who is really beautiful on the inside because the outside might not look so good. Oh, the mistakes of people to deal with the camouflage of life, to look upon life as something that you see on the outside and not realize that the most beautiful things are those things which are invisible, like God the Father himself, a spirit. So what are these beautiful things that belong to the inner, the inner self, the inner being? They are faith. They are trust. They are humility, love, patience. And while these attributes of God are intended to build up and strengthen Christians, sadly, these are the things which oftentimes show off our weaknesses. Paul looks on the inside with his words that are before us today. He wants us to care for and be responsible to that voice on the inside who speaks out and oftentimes is not heard. So what does it mean to care for the inner self? It means simply that we must experience Christ. And I'm not referring to emotionalism or some euphoric, short-lived sensation. I'm talking about a genuine, personal involvement with Jesus Christ. You see, loved ones, the presence of our inner self suggests that Christianity, that powerful way of life, is not merely a teaching, but it is a true and real experience with God. The problem is, however, that Christianity has become a shallow thing in the lives of so many people today because the heart has not really been touched. But loved ones before, Christianity will mean anything to any of us. The heart must experience an individual encounter with God. Each and every one of us needs a personal experience where, where Jesus takes complete possession of the heart. Otherwise, that inner self starves. And you can come to this church every Sunday and sing the songs and hear the prayers and be a part of the service. And yet the inner self is starving because you are not letting God in. He stays on the outside. You don't let him dare touch you. You're afraid. You don't want him to touch the faith, the trust, the love, and the compassion and humility which would overtake you when Jesus comes into the heart. A thousand people might tell you that honey is sweet, but you would never know it until you have yourself tasted it. In other words, my friends, outward acts will never do. Each of us must be reached on the inside. Notice again the language of Paul in our text. Ephesians 3, 16 and 17 and verse 19 reads, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Loved ones, Paul strikes deep into our soul with these words. He is looking for the real me. He is asking me to see what he actually is saying, that man is made up of a spirit and a soul and that he possesses God's image, which means he has a soul to be fed. So it is not enough to go to church, as important as that is. 
It is not enough to support the programs of the church, as important as that is. It is not enough to engage in its activities as important as that could be. One can do all this and be far, far, far away from the kingdom of God. There must rather be a willingness, a willingness to yield to the Spirit of God who calls for entrance into our hearts through the power of the Word. One must submit to the language of God and the longings for God that exist within the human heart. You see, this strengthening of which Paul speaks is to come to us in connection with Christ by the personal medium of the Holy Spirit who operates through the Word and Sacrament. And through the Word and Sacrament, the Spirit's power flows out into the heart, mind, soul, and spirit of believers. And the moment this occurs, the real me is regenerated and made spiritually alive. Ephesians 2.5 reads, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You see, once the heart, mind, and soul has been renewed and born again, made spiritually alive in Christ, the real me is given power and strength to assert myself in the fullest manner of Christian life. This spiritual state of being is what every person needs. Paul tells us that Christ dwells in our hearts and that he is rooted and grounded there by our love for God and that the Spirit's strengthening is what causes that inner self to be fed. This means it is Christ living and alive in our hearts. Living and alive in our hearts that alone produces a saving faith. So when we deal with the real me, we deal with the concept of a saving faith. A saving faith does not exist apart from Jesus Christ. This is the unpopular, but nevertheless, the saving gospel. And without allowing the Holy Spirit to work faith in my heart through the hearing of God's word in truth, without giving my heart to and living my life for Jesus Christ, I do not have saving faith. A saving faith means that Christ dwells within me. I live with him each day. I experience his presence. It means that I would be true to him even if the whole world should turn against him. And my friends, that's happening before our eyes. A saving faith is the personal trust and confidence in the wonderful message of the gospel that God, for Christ's sake, is gracious to all who believe in the atoning blood of Jesus that he so lovingly and so obediently shed on Calvary for the sins of the whole world. A saving faith is found only in the heart that says, I believe in Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. He redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased me and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of Satan. And once you really realize this, boy, you love Jesus. You know Jesus. You experience Jesus alive within you. And loved ones, the moment you personally experience his presence, it will mean everything to you. You see, loving God is not an experiment. It is an experience. It is grounded in faith to take ourselves into the very heaven of heavens and to lay ourselves at the feet of Christ who gives to us this faith. 
You don't pick faith out of the air. It is given by the one who implants it in us, by the Holy Spirit, through the word in truth. You know, the trouble with much of the church life in America is that we have been starving the inner self while stuffing to the brim the outer shell. The body is fed, but the soul starves. This must change if we are to heed the real me and satisfy the real me. So how do we do that? Well, the real me needs daily prayer. Do you pray every day? What do you say? Is prayer really a living walk and talk with the Lord? Or is it just a garbled bit of something that goes on because you've been taught that? Listen what the Bible says about prayer. Psalm 50:15 reads, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. And Philippians 4, 6 reads, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And Acts 3, 19 through 21 reads, Repent, therefore, and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing prayer may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. And Psalm 63, 5 and 6 reads, My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. Who doesn't like fatty, rich food? My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. And Colossians 4.2 reads, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. You know, one of the mistakes people make is that people think prayer is for God. Prayer is not for God. Prayer is a gift from God for us. God has given prayer to us so that we can be comforted by him. And when we know that, that is really a gracious, loving gift from a gracious, loving Father. And the Bible says to pray without ceasing. It tells us that every person should pray. Why? Because the real me needs it. The real me wants it. The real me yearns for it. And loved ones, the real me will starve without it. The real me also needs Bible reading. Do you read your Bible every day? If I were to ask people to hold up their hands if they read their Bible every day, maybe we would be shocked. The fact is that far too many people are not in the Word today. But what does God say about Bible study? Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7 reads, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit at your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Sounds like we should be in the Word all the time, doesn't it? 1 Peter 3.15 reads, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. 
Now, of course, no one will ever be prepared to speak to another about Christ unless they really know what the Bible says. And Psalm 119.105 reads, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119.15 reads, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. And 1 John 4.1 reads, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. It's pretty hard to test whether a pastor or a church or a lay person is telling you the truth about God, about salvation, about eternal life, if you don't know what the Bible says. And 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 reads, all scripture, all scripture, not part of scripture, not picking and choosing scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Loved ones, the real me needs Bible study. The real me is saying, oh, I want that word, that precious manna from heaven that fuels my soul. That wonderful rain that flows into my heart, I want that. I need it like a flower in the field and a grass in the meadow. My friends, we all need to be filled to the brim with the water of God's love. That spiritual nourishment of one's soul comes only through the Word of God. You don't pull it out of the air. It comes with reading the Bible. And the real me needs it. And the real me wants it. And the real me needs to be filled to the brim with that every single day. The real me also needs and wants quiet time. Something that has been taken away from this smartphone infested world in which we live. But the real me wants and needs quiet time alone with God. Psalm 37 7 reads, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. And Job 6.24 reads, Teach me, and I will be silent. Make me understand how I have gone astray. And Psalms 46.10 reads, Be still and know that I am God. And Isaiah 26.3 reads, You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. My friends, we are so busy with life. We are so busy taking care of the outside that we forget to care for the inside by taking time out to be quiet before God. But the real me wants to pray. The real me wants to meditate on Christ. The real me wants to be fed with the word, hearing the Lord's voice in the quiet of one's own home. So turn off that phone. Turn off that TV. Turn off that news, that computer. Open your Bible and let the soul be fed. Take quality time out to think and to meditate on God and Christ and take time out and feed that voice within that is crying out, please, please, listen to me. I am the real you. Loved ones, take time out to think heavenly thoughts. Think of good things. Think of life as a journey and a walk with the Lord to heaven. Dwell on that. The real me needs that. The real me cries out for that. Loved ones, don't neglect the inner self. 
Who can be filled with the fullness of God without a slow, deliberate, meditative prayer life apart from the demands and noise of the world? Jesus spent all night in prayer at times. Who does that now? Luther said that he used to spend three hours per day in prayer. Silly man, wasn't he? <laughs> By our standards, he wasted a lot of time. But because he was unhurried, he left behind a beautiful heritage of Christian truth. Who attends Bible studies today? Sadly, very few. Jesus taught his disciples in unhurried discourse on the mountainside. Where's your mountaintop? Where's your unhurried devotional life? Are you paying attention to the needs of your soul? Loved ones, what we desperately need is a renewal of interest in the core teachings of Christian truth. We need to be rooted and grounded in love. We need to be concerned for our faith, our trust in God, our humility, our love, and our patience. Because these should be my key emphasis as a Christian. My friends, we are a nation guilty of moving farther and farther away from the truths of God. What we need is a return to the old-fashioned emphasis of quietly sitting at the feet of Jesus and feeding that inner self with his word, to talk with God in prayer, and to seek out Christ to give him my thanks, my praise, and my love for his wonderful mercy and grace. My friends, there are two beings within each of us. Which one do you give the most care? The outer shell? Or the real me? Glorious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, wonderful Savior, open our hearts and our minds to your word today, Father. Teach us to slow down in life, to meditate before you, to spend time in your word, to give you our prayer so that we can be filled with your love. Holy God, we don't spend enough quality time with you. Let us change that today. Let us heed these words of Scripture and be focused on the real me because the real me is who needs you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.